All right. Um, okay, everyone. So, uh, so welcome to SUMS. <clears throat> um, my name is uh, Richard Schwartz. I'm one of the faculty sponsors for this. Uh, my colleague Benoit Passadere is the is the other one. And uh, let me say first that mostly this event is organized and run by students in the Brown Math Department. And uh, this year, the team is uh, Alexander Benjamin, Griffin Edwards, David Gao, Joseph Flavinka, Josiah Lim, Amelia Shapiro, and Henry Talbot. And you'll be hearing from them throughout the day. Um, on the subject of people, uh, in the math department, um, Audrey Aguiar and Lori Nascimento sort of work behind the scenes to kind of make this thing run uh, every year. And then for sponsorship, uh, we get money from the Brown Math Department and from the Brown Applied Math Department and also from ISERM, which is uh, the Institute for uh, Experiment and Computation in Mathematical Sciences. Uh, so uh, SUMS uh, has been running for maybe 16 or 17 years, and uh, it's the Symposium for Undergraduates in Mathematical Sciences. And the idea is it's supposed to be math and X, where, where X can be different things uh, each year. So, so some year, one year it was math and physics, one year math and the environment, uh, math and information, math and symmetry. Uh, last year was math and thinking systems, and this year was uh, math and illusion. Um, so uh, unlike in previous years, um, <laughs> I mean, it's over Zoom. Um, I think there's many, many more people, which is which is kind of uh, unusual. Last year, it was on March 7th, and I remember telling people not to come too close to each other because there was this thing called COVID, which was sort of on the horizon. Uh, we had like, it was like the last event we had at Brown. Um, so uh, there's not too much else I want to say, uh, except one thing is that we also, not only in addition to this, um, uh, the Zoom seminar, we have a gather town site during the long breaks in the middle, and you know, I encourage people to check that out. Um, so again, uh, welcome to SUMS. Good morning, everyone. My name is Henry Talbot. I am an undergraduate mathematics student at Brown, and I'm really excited to have you all at SUMS today. As for our first speaker, I'm happy to introduce Professor Percy Diaconis. Professor Diaconis is the Mary B. Sinceri Professor of Statistics and Professor of Mathematics at Stanford University. He is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Statistical Association, and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. We're really lucky to have him with us, and we're excited to hear his presentation. He'll be speaking about the infinite random graph, and yes, there is only one. Hi, everybody. You're good. Uh, super. Uh, so I, I think that one of the reasons that I was invited uh, is because I have a fascination and long time interest in magic tricks and illusion. And uh, unfortunately, I found it's very hard to do magic tricks over Zoom. They just <laughs> don't work. And uh, so I'm going to have to, I decided to show you a different kind of magic. Um, and that's the magic of mathematics, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, and the, the story is, I, I met an amazing object that I'm trying to become friends with. And I thought if I got to tell you about it and make it your friend, that would help me understand it. So you're, you're helping me as, as you'll see. Um, and uh, the, the object, I'm, I'm going to try to share this and um, the object the, the object is the random graph and um, to try to motivate it um, picture if you will a um, hundred points and labeled one up to a hundred and for every pair of points flip a fair coin uh, and if it comes up heads join the two points with an edge and if it comes up tails don't they don't know each other and do that for each pair of points. That's the Erdős Renyi random graph. And uh, so it'll, it'll have some edges and some not and it'll just be a mess. Um, and now <clears throat> do it again. That is just take the same hundred points and um, flip coins again, you'll get another random graph. And um, a, a question is, what's the chance that those two graphs are the same? 
And by the same, I mean isomorphic. And, uh, and I, I'm, I always have trouble getting this thing to scroll down, but eventually it, it works. And uh, uh, that looks good. OK, <laughs> good. Um, so what does it mean to say that they're the same? It means that I should be able to find, relabel the vertices and make them the same graph. That is, there should be a, a, a function that takes the, the, one, the numbers one up to 100 and gives them new names. And then there's an edge between i and j in the first graph, if and only if there's an edge between f of i and f of j in the second in the second graph. One point of this is it's not so easy. Um, and just try to think with me for a second. Here are three graphs um, on not so many points. And if you look at them, at least to me, they look pretty different. Um, and uh, yet they're all the same graph. They're all isomorphic. And um, uh, you might think, well, suppose somebody gave me two graphs and wanted to know, are they isomorphic or not? How would I do it? Well, I guess you could you know, look at the degrees of the different vertices. And if the one, vertex, one graph has degree five and another graph doesn't, that, that, that is a sign they're, not, they're for sure not isomorphic. But it, it's, it's a famous hard task. And it's one of the great results in graph theory um, uh, within the last few years um, that um, Latsi Babai found that there is some kind of an algorithm that you could almost think of using for this problem. It, it works in e to the log n cube time, but still, and, and it's a very, very deep uh, uh, fact uh, that you, you can make progress on the graph isomorphism problem. We won't have to do that, but um, I, I couldn't say. Uh, so back to business, I have two graphs and both with independent coin flips. What's the chance that they're the same? Well, it's tiny. Intuitively, it's tiny, but actually it's tiny. Uh, the, the chance that they're the same graph is, is at most um, uh, n factorial um, divided by 2 to the n squared. Now, where does that come from? Well, whatever this graph is, um, the chance of any graph is you flip a coin for each edge, there are n choose two edges. The chance of any graph is one over n choose two. And there are at most n factorial permutations, ways of trying. And so the, the, the chance that they're the same graph is at most this much. And this is a teeny tiny number. When n is 100, this number is you know, 10, less than 10 to the 1300. So it, it just is no chance that, that two random graphs on a large set are isomorphic. But what if n is infinity? Well, the point that's weird is if n is infinity, the chance that the two graphs are isomorphic is one. And I, I still find that very disturbing and um, uh, it makes me wonder whether there really is an infinity out there. And, um, uh, and so I wanna talk to you about that. Um, and the first thing is let me demystify it by proving it. Um, uh, so, forget about random anything for a while. Um, here's a property that a given graph might or might not have. Um, the property which I'm going to be calling star, and I'll keep coming back to it. So this is a good thing to get your head around. Um, suppose I have two finite disjoint sets, different sets of vertices in the graph. I'm calling them u1 up to um and v1 up to vn, so n plus m vertices. It might or might not be the case that there's another vertex, Z, which is adjacent to all of the U's and not adjacent to all of the V's. That for, for every set of U's and V's, it might or might not be that the graph has that property. Um, the theorem follows from the following two facts. The first fact is that with probability one, a countable random graph satisfies property star. So, okay, and the second fact is, nothing to do with probability. If you have two countable graphs satisfying star, then they're isomorphic. And, and so that will show that, that there, there, there is this strange beast. And let's just prove it because it's not bad and I think it demystifies it. Um, so the first fact I wanna prove is that um, star holes 
for sure with probability one in a, in a random graph. Remember, I'm going to have an infinite graph. Um, and so it's the same thing to show that the probability that star fails is zero. OK, so let's do this calculation. Pick two sets of vertices, U1 up to UM and V1 up to VN, and consider a bunch of other vertices, just disjoint ones. Um, what's the chance that none of those new Zs are correctly joined? Well, the chance that a, a, the chance of, of a Z being correctly joined it, it is 1 over 2 to the M plus M. So the chance it's not correctly joined is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the M plus N. And then they have to all fail. And so the chance that they all fail is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the M plus N raised to the nth power, because everything's independent. And of course, when N is large, as N goes to 0, that tends to 0. And no matter what little m and little n are, that, that, that tends to 0. So, so the probability that star fails for this set, U1, the Us, and the Vs that I started out with, is 0. And then it's a basic fact of measure theory that if you have, there are only countably many possible choices for the Us and the Vs. And if you have a countable collection of sets of measure 0, their union has measure 0. And, um, and so, uh, so with probability 1, star holes. Um, so OK. The, the fa fact two, and let's just again do it because I hope it, it's, it, it demystifies it. Suppose I have two random graphs and they both satisfy star. I'm going to build an isomorphism between them. Um, and, and here's how it goes. Of course, I'm going to take any vertex here and star out by mapping it to any vertex there. And that's OK. Two vertices, two single points, that's isomorphic. Suppose that I have been going on doing this. And uh, at, at stage n, um, uh, I, I've, I've gotten n points in graph 1. And I found in other points in graph two, and I've associated them so that the induced subgraphs, meaning uh, well, meaning uh, all the all of the edges that connect points between the x's in gamma one, and all of the y's that that connect points in gamma two, those two subgraphs are isomorphic. So suppose I built up a little uh, isomorphic pair. And now what we're going to do is to just add a new point. So um, pick any, any, any point, xn plus 1, in the first graph, and let u be the neighbors of xn plus 1 among the, the previously chosen points. And let v be the, the other points uh, in, among x1 up to xn. A, pot a potential image of xn plus 1 must be adjacent to all of the images of u and not adjacent to all of the images of v. But because gamma 2 satisfies star, I can find a point yn plus 1, which is adjacent to all of the these and not adjacent to all of those, and just associate xn plus 1 to yn plus 1. And you you could just keep going that way, and the, but there's one more task we have to achieve, which is we have to make the map onto. That is, we have to associate every vertex here with a vertex here, and it has to be onto. And in order to do that, we use what logicians often call the back and forth argument. And uh, I'll just say it carefully. So suppose we've been, well, I don't want to use the axiom of choice, so let, let me let, let me enumerate the, the the vertices in gamma one. Let me call them x one, x two, etc. And let me enumerate the ones in gamma two, y one, y two, etc. And then, after an even number of steps, let m say be the smallest index, so that x m isn't isn't hasn't been matched yet. I've built up my map so far. And um, and then extend the the map to to that next point f n plus one. 
for an odd number of steps, work backwards. Look at all of the points that are matched in gamma two, find the smallest label, which isn't matched to anything back here, and then using, using the property star for gamma one, um, you, can, you, can, you can match that point. That is, this yn plus one will have to be, is, is in gamma two, is matched to some points here and not to others. And so you map that set back. You have to find something which is matched to the pre-image of that and not matched to the pre-image of the complement. And there is one. And so uh, it's OK. That is, uh, you, every, every point here is, is, appears, and every point here appears. And, and, and we, we've done. So sorry for starting off proving a theorem, but math is beautiful, and, and it, 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 I found it nice. So, so we can talk about the random graph because there's only one. <laughs> that is, any, any, any graph which has this, this property star. Uh, so for example, I flipped the coins with probability a half. I could have flipped the coins with probability a tenth. The argument still goes through exactly the same, and the graph you get is isomorphic to the old random graph that, that, I, that I built. So there's this object. Now, that's not so satisfying. It's not the same as having it in hand. So let me do some constructions. Um, and there are lots of constructions, and that's how I stumbled into this subject um, and work with a logician, Mary Anthony Miliaris, and maybe I'll come to that. But um, let's, let's build one. And um, so one way to build one, a nice way to build one, is to look at the set of primes, which are one mod four. So that's five, 13, what's the next one, 19? No, <laughs> what's the next prime? Uh, that's one mod four after 13. Um, not 17, huh? 19, 23? No, anyway, there are infinitely many primes that are one mod four. And um, uh, let script P be, be the set of all of them. Okay, uh, that's gonna be my set that I'm gonna build the graph structure on. And r recall or be introduced to the fact that if you have a number a mod p, um, then uh, if the equation x squared is congruent to a has a solution, a is called a quadratic residue or just a residue mod p. And uh, half the numbers mod p are residues and half aren't. And we write ap is one. This is the Legendre symbol. AP is one if A is a residue mod P and AP is minus one if it's not a residue mod P. A beautiful theorem of Gauss, of uh, other people too, um, is the law of quadratic reciprocity, which says if P and Q are, says a lot more, but it says this in particular, if P and Q are distinct odd primes, then the product of these two Legendre symbols is minus one to the P minus one over two times Q minus one over two. So if P and Q are both one mod four, then if I subtract one, that's a multiple of four. So th the right-hand side is one. And what that means is that if P is a residue mod Q, then Q is a residue mod P. And uh, so therefore we can make a graph on the primes, which are one mod four, which connects P and Q if and only if, P is a residue uh, mod Q or vice versa. It's a symmetric graph. The, so that sounds like number theory and doesn't sound anything like flipping coins, um, but it's a little theorem that this graph, which we really did just build in a, in a sense, is, is isomorphic to the, the random graph. And the proof is a nice illustration of elementary number theory or pretty elementary. Um, uh, so consider, remember I have to take M, M points and N points. So consider M primes and another N primes, which are in this set P, that I can always choose for each prime, a number, the ith prime, a number AI, such that um, AI is a residue mod P because half the numbers of mod P are residues. And I can choose BJs so that the, um, uh, so that the BJ isn't a residue 
uh, mod pi. And then consider the set of equations, find an x in the integers, which is congruent to ai uh, mod pi and uh, congruent to bj mod pj and also is congruent to one mod four. Um, the Chinese remainder theorem, very classical elementary theorem in number theory says that there are, that you can solve such equations um, always. Uh, and there's a unique smallest positive solution, x naught, uh, mod the product of all of the moduli involved, four times the product of the p's times the product of the q's. And then all solutions, and there are infinitely many solutions, um, all solutions are, con are congruent to x naught mod this um, mod this modulus. So, so you can solve that equation and we understand what all the solutions are. Well, there's a classical theorem of Dirichlet's uh, which says that if you have any arithmetic progression, it has infinitely many primes. So therefore, there are infinitely many solutions x, which are primes, which are one mod four, because I made them be one mod four. So I, I can, so I verified property star for this setup. So, so that, that's it. That, so this is isomorphic to the random graph. Um, uh, somehow one of, one of many appearances. Um, there's another one that I'll be using, and it's maybe more down to earth in a certain way. And here we're going to build the random graph on the ordinary integers. So let capital N here be 0, 1, 2, 3, just the usual integers. I'm going to connect two vertices, i and j. Let me suppose that i is less than j. I'm going to connect two vertices, i and j, if, that is, i is an edge in this ij is an edge in this graph if the ith binary digit of j is a one now that takes a little thinking about so let's think about it so for example what's zero connected to well zero is connected to the set of all j's such that the zero digit that is the the rightmost the trailing digit is a, is a one that, that those are all the odd numbers that is binary numbers whose binary expansion ends in one those are the odd numbers. So zero is going to, here's a picture, zero is going to be connected to all the odd numbers, exactly those. What's one connected to? Well, one is connected to all j's such that the bit one over, uh, so the second bit is a one. What are those numbers? They're numbers which are two or four, two or three, sorry, mod four. That is numbers that begin, that end one zero or numbers that end one one. Those are numbers that are two or three mod four. And so one is connected to two and three, should be connected to three, there it is. And, and, and then it should be connected to five and um, eight, no, sorry, <laughs> five and uh, seven, right? It better be connected to seven and so forth. So that is the recipe for constructing a graph. And it's very easy to check this condition. Um, uh, let, let's just do it in the air for a second without writing. So if I have two sets of numbers, I1 up to IM and J1 up to JM, I have to find a number which is um, which is which is connected to all of the i's and not connected to all of the j's. But that's easy. Just put ones in the i first position and the i second position. Those are distinct positions. Start to write a binary number by putting ones in those positions, and then put zeros in the in the j positions, and then complete it any way you want, or just stop. That that number will be connected to all the i's and not connected to all the j's. So that's it. Um, uh, that's, uh, that's our, that's our graph. So there are many more constructions and, um, I'll come back to one and I stumbled into one in some work I was doing, which made me want to understand this better. It's a strange object and I want to tell you some of its properties. Uh, so the first property is it's very robust. Um, you can just 
do lots of different things to it, lots and lots, and you don't destroy it. For example, you can delete any finite number of vertices. You've got the random graph or any of the models we just built, just erase you know, 100 vertices any which way. It's still isomorphic to the random graph. And by now you could see, suppose I erased five vertices, and then you give me another M vertices and another N vertices, all distinct. Well, you know, I just put those five here, and then I can find another vertex, which is uh, adjacent to, to all of these, and maybe these two, I don't care, and, but it's still adjacent to all of these and, um, and not to any of these. So it's just, it doesn't change it. So it's, and you can similarly see that if you erase a hundred edges, um, uh, it's fine. You can't add a vertex because I could add a singleton vertex which isn't connected to anything. And that's bad. That is the random graph. Every vertex is connected to half of the integers, um, just like vertex zero is connected to all the odd numbers. Every vertex is connected to half the, half the uh, rest of the vertices. So uh, you, there are no isolates in the, in the random graph. So, um, but still it's, it's stable in that, in that way. Um, a somewhat surprising thing when you first hear about it is the pigeonhole um, property. Uh, that is, suppose I take the set of vertices and I divide it into five pieces. Some of them finite, maybe all of them infinite. One of those pieces, it, it will have to be countable and it, it will be the random graph. Um, and, uh, uh, and again, why is that true? Uh, it's easy to see. Suppose it failed, that is none of the pieces um, are the random graph. Well, that means each piece, there's a, there's a U1 up to UM and a V1 up to VM. And here there's a U1 prime up to U, V prime, V, you know, there's U's and V's in each piece take the union of those in the original graph and the, you know, there's no edge that goes to all of the U's and, and doesn't go to all of the V's because it, it fails in, in, in at least in, in, in all of them. Um, so, so this pigeonhole property follows easily and, but it shows that it, it's a pretty robust um, object. Um, this pigeonhole property characterizes the graph that is, if you have an infinite graph, and if it satisfies this pigeonhole property um, with respect to uh, uh, star, uh, the, this then 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 either it could be the empty graph, or it's the complete graph. That is, everything's connected to everything else, or it's the random graph. I mean, that's a that's a, a characterization. So pigeonhole property is a is a good one. Um, one just easy consequence is this graph is isomorphic to its complement. That is, um, if you just erase every edge and uh, that's there, and if there's no edge between i and j, put one in, take the complementary graph, that's isomorphic to the original one. Why? It's because property star is clearly symmetric uh, in, in u and v. So, uh, uh, um, okay. So, getting a little peek at the random graph. Universality is, so the random graph is often called R and R is for Richard Rado, R-A-D-O. And um, he built it for this reason, um, it's universal. Um, it, it contains every finite or, and countable graph, every graph, every finite or countable graph is contained in this random graph as an induced subgraph. And first of all, let's, prove that, because it's easy to see why it's true. So suppose you give me some graph, maybe it's a path of, of any length, but say of length five, okay. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm enumerate the, the vertices of the graph so that I have a first one, a second one, a third one, a fourth one, a fifth one, and um, enumerate those vertices. And then um, just instead of going back and forth with the isomorphism, just go forth, that is map, the first vertex uh, anywhere into the random graph doesn't matter, and then you can always extend the the the, the mapping. So I've got a, 
I've, I've got to find a, a second vertex, which is adjacent to the first one. Well, there is one. And then I've got to find a third vertex, which is adjacent to the second vertex, but not to the first one. Well, I can do that and just keep going. So just build your graph one step at a time. It doesn't have to be, you can just do that with any countable graph. So this, this graph contains all, so it's hard to picture. Of course, it's hard to picture. It has a countable collection of points. For example, there's some infinite set of points, which gives you the empty graph. That is, there is an infinite set of points and there are no edges um, between that set of points. Of course, each point is connected to countably at many other points, but for this countable set of points, because that's a graph, the empty graph is a graph. There's another countable set of points where it's the complete graph. Everything's connected to everything else. There are infinite paths, infinite stars, there's everything. Um, and so that that's our um, that's the property that is called universality. And uh, um, we'll yes, homogeneity is a problem is a property that we'll abstract in a second. Every isomorphism between two induced subgraphs. So find a path and um, then of length five, say, and find another path of length five. There's an isomorphism, you know, that that takes one to the other. You can identify vertices, and then that isomorphism can be extended to an isomorphism of the full graph. That's what homogeneity means. And um, why is that? Well, this argument that I did about extending uh, maps, it, it it can start at any isomorphism. It didn't have to start at the empty isomorphism. Just started at the isomorphism you started with, and then just build up one step at a time. You have to go back and forward in order to make it an isomorphism onto. But um, so this, um, the the random graph is, is, is homogeneous. Um, uh, um, as a corollary, the symmetry group of the random graph is huge. Um, it acts transitively, that is on any kind of finite substructure. That is, it, you know, given two points, there's an automorphism that takes one to the other. Given two stars, there's an automorphism that takes one to the other. Given any two isomorphic finite graphs, the group acts transitively on, on, on those. There's been a lot of study, I'm not gonna talk to you about it here, about how big is the automorphism group? It's big and we know a lot about it. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's two to the alif null. It's, there's, there's uncountably many um, uh, automorphisms of this, of this poor thing. Um, here's, here's a thing that I learned that I thought I found surprising. Um, for model theorists, for logicians, the random graph, the graph R, um, the Rado graph, is just as important as the rational numbers. I've seen that written down. I've heard people say it. And I said, what? You know, the rational numbers. It's the rational numbers. Come on. <laughs> what are you talking about? Well, here's their point of view. Um, take the rational numbers, call it Q, and consider it as an ordered set. That is, it's a countable, complete, linearly ordered set you can compare it to. Um, it's homogeneous um, uh, in the sense that if you have two finite ordered subsets, which are in, in the same order, then there is, there is a, a mapping of the rationals into themselves, which extends that um, isomorphism, uh, it's easy to see too. The, so Q is homogeneous, and um, and and there is a notion in model theory of taking a, a, a limit of a collection of nice objects in a relational language, um, and Q is the for say limit of finite linear orders. So take the set of all finite li linearly ordered sets. There's a limit object, and that's Q. Take the set of all graphs. There's a limit object, and that's R. And um, and many of the properties of Q and R are parallel. Of course, I don't know how to do number theory on R yet, but uh, 
um, we're, we're working on it. Um, uh, um, one more property, um, uh, which is the following. The first order theory um, uh, of, in the language of graphs. So the language of graphs is just all sentences you can write down using there exist for every variables and one symmetric relationship, the relationship of you know, X twiddles Y. Um, uh, so the, 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 the language with one symmetric relation uh, is the language of graph theory. And um, the following is true. Any sentence, any first order sentence, uh, which I'm calling theta, the, the, the following three things are equivalent. Um, theta holds in almost all simple graphs. So theta is true, except for finitely many exceptions. The second thing is theta holds in R. So R determines all such things. And the third is that theta is a logical consequence, you know, modus ponens, modus tollens, little logic steps from the axioms. The axioms are that fact I said about U1 up to UN, M and V1 up to VM, that, that you can always extend. That is, if you have, if you have, a system which satisfies those axioms, you can one step at a time deduce theta from, uh, from uh, whether theta is true or false um, uh, from, from those axioms. Now, I'm not gonna say more about that because most interesting facts about graphs are not first order, um, uh, but, you know, Diameter two contains a finite gamma. There are lots of statements that the axioms themselves are first order statements. And so, um, so this, uh, the, the, the random graph has a, uh, is, a, is a crystalline object from that, from that point of view. Um, okay, so I'm gonna pause for a minute with a commercial announcement. <laughs> um, my computer's always doing that for me. I'm gonna do it for you. Um, Everything I've just told you about and much, much more with full references and proofs is stolen is too strong a word, but borrowed, I'm giving credit, from a wonderful article by Peter Cameron and um, it's on the archive and it's just the article is called The Random Graph. And so if you wanna see the literature and the history and lots of other examples and constructions and it's beautifully written. Um, and so look up Peter Cameron's article. That's my, that's my commercial announcement. Um, um, here's a confession. Um, and um, everybody has their own way of understanding math. Uh, and um, so I'm in this, this situation. I've just met this strange new object and I'm trying to trick myself into thinking about it, you know, not just reading the statements, but actually thinking about it. Well, the a main way that I trick myself into thinking about anything um, is to try to relate it to shuffling cards. That's what I've been doing for a very long time. And uh, so I study how many times does it, do you have to shuffle a deck of cards to mix it up? Well, a little bit more abstractly, I study random walks on groups. Um, and so it's a natural question for me, can I make a random walk? on the Rado graph. Okay, that, you know, if, if I can, then I can ask my kind of questions and I'll be led to look at this graph with different set of eyes. So let me, I started, it's interesting and I don't know the answer, but maybe one of you will know the answer. Um, uh, so let me start with a concrete model and then I'll get rid of it at the end. But let me start with a concrete model. And you remember I built, we built the random, we built the graph on the integers where I connected i and j if the ith bit of j is a one going in from the right. And so zero is connected to all the odd numbers, one is connected to zero and all j's, which are two or three mod four and so forth. Um, so that's my version of the nice picture I had before. Um, so each vertex is connected to infinitely many things. So this is definitely not a locally finite object. Each, each vertex has half the integers as its neighbors. Okay, how do I walk around on such a thing at random? What would be a natural way of walking around on the random graph? Um, one way is the following. 
fix some probability distribution and I'll just pick one, it doesn't matter. Uh, but so suppose I take what's what we call the geometric distribution, which is flip a coin and look at the number of tails until the first head comes up, a fair coin. So the chance that that happens at time j is one over two to the j plus one. Um, uh, when j goes through all the integers. So pick some probability measure on the, on the integers and start a random walk on the radograph, start at say at zero. And the rule is the following, um, um, from j, if at any time you're at the vertex j, look at all the neighbors of j and um, pick one of them from this probability distribution, just restricted to um, the set of neighbors. And then, you know, renormalize it so that it's a probability distribution. That's quite a simple natural thing to do. Just from J, you go to one of its neighbors and use these weights to make your choice. So you can write that down. The chance of going from J to J prime is Q of J, the chance of picking um, that should be J prime, okay, Q of J prime, uh, divided by the sum of the all of the neighboring probabilities. So Q of J prime um, or zero, of course, if J and J prime aren't, aren't connected. Um, and uh, so that's a natural random walk on the radograph. So then, you know, as in Casablanca, round up the usual subjects, um, suspects, <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, suppose you run this walk, is it recurrent? That is, does it come back to zero? Um, does it hit every point? Uh, does it drift off to infinity in some sense? How many points will it hit by time n? That is, what's the range of the of this Markov chain? Um, or if you keep the list of where it's been, how far away did it get? Uh, what's the maximum? Uh, so if you start thinking about it, there are lots of questions you could ask. And I, I point out, this isn't physics or biology or anything. Nobody needs to be, know, know the answer to these questions, except me. <laughs> that is, it, it, I find approaching a subject this way leads me to cut into it in a different way and uh, leads to fresh questions and understanding. Um, and let me take you to the, through the first steps of that. Uh, so I started answers. Um, so uh, I started thinking about this in conjunction with this talk. My first answer is yes. <laughs> well, the walk visits every point infinitely often. And in fact, there's a stationary distribution. Um, and I'll explain what that means by just constructing it. And, and that's a probability distribution pi of j. I'll tell you what it is. And what it means to say it's a stationary distribution means two things. One is if you run the walk for a long time, I'm calling the walk xn. If you run the walk for a long time and ask what's the chance you're at j, it has a limit and it's this probability pi of j. Um, and here's the little theorem that I observe, um, which is that pi of j, there's a normalizing constant and it's just got a very simple formula. It's, it's q of j um, times the, the, the Q measure of the neighborhood of J, the sum of all of the Q weights of the neighborhood of J. Um, and, um, uh, and let me prove that because it's instructive, um, uh, I hope. Um, uh, so remember that the, the, the chance of going from I to J in one step of the walk, where you have to, you have to pick J from out of all of the neighbors. This is the chance of going from I to J or, or zero if I and J aren't connected, of course. But if I and J are connected, the chance of going from I to J is, 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 is this. Well, I claim if you choose this weight, pi of I, you can verify, we'll verify it, this equation. The equation physicists call detailed balance and we call reversibility. Pi of i times kij is pi of j times kji, this kind of symmetry relation. And that's very easy to verify. I, I've said what pi of i is, and let's just write down the left-hand side. Well, it's pi of i, that is this normalizing constant, times q of i, times q of the neighborhood of, 
um, of, of, of I, that's what I claim uh, the stationary distribution is, times the chance of going from I to J, well, that's Q of J divided by the neighborhood of I, and these cancel. And so this is just QI, QJ times a constant, and that's symmetric in I and J. And so just it's, it's equal to that, everything cancels. Well, what that says is that, look at this sum, pick I from pi and then take a step from the kernel. Well, that's what this sum means. Um, use reversibility, that's the sum in I of pi J times KJI, take the pi J out of the sum, and then this is a stochastic kernel summed in its second argument, that's one. So that means that this vector pi of I is a left eigenvector for the matrix um, uh, Kij with eigenvalue one, which is another definition of the stationary distribution. Now, notice that nothing I've just said depends in any way on the model of the random graph I used, nor on the nor on the probability that is, uh, nor on Q. That is, for any model of the random graph in any choice of Q. The, the 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 Markov chain has a stationary distribution. And then it's a it's a standard and quite elementary theorem that if you have a Markov chain with a stationary distribution, then it's recurrent and you then you come back and hit and hit points uh, in, you, you come you hit every point infinitely often and uh, and we know more about it. Okay. Given that, um, now I can ask my usual question. How many times do I have to shuffle the cards to mix them up? Okay, here's this Markov chain. I know what its limiting distribution is. How long do I have to run the chain till it's stationary? And I can't solve that question because um, it's a fresh question. But I thought about it for an hour or two this morning. Um, everything is above. Um, look at the... The, the chance that you're at J starting at some point A after N steps in the, in the Markov chain. And given epsilon bigger than zero, how large does N have to be so that the distance of this probability distribution to the limit is small? And I'd like to also know, how does it depend on state A? If you start to think about that question, it gets you thinking about the random graph in ways that I think nobody's thought about it before. And also, I don't know the answer. So, um, okay, so um, I want to summarize and then surrender. Um, so what I told you about is I described the random graph. I find it a, a magical object, so I'm not apologizing for not doing a magic trick. That's a magic trick for me. We built it in many ways. We built it randomly. We built it in primes. We built it on N. I didn't tell you how I stumbled into it, but um, I showed you that it's robust. Uh, erase anything. It's universal. That is, contains every, all subgraphs as, um, uh, as induced subgraphs. It's homogeneous. Um, and it captures the first order properties of graphs. It has many other properties. Um, one thing to watch out for, it has many friends. So if you start looking in Cameron's article, you'll see lots of other things. For example, there's the random triangle free graph. There's the random tournament. I won't say carefully, but let me just say for one sentence, what's the Eurozone space? The Euro Eurozone space is the limit of all finite metric spaces. So the Eurozone space is a complete separable metric space. That is, it's a set with the metric on it when it's a separate and accountable dense subset. So it's a complete separable metric space, which contains every other complete separable metric space as an induced metric space. So you give me any other uh, separable metric space, I can take a separating, take a countable dense subset, take a, fin take a finite metric space. Uh, I can find finitely many points in this limit object, the Eurozone space, um, such that the, the, the distance between them is exactly the distance in your metric space. Um, it's a surprising object. It's also connected to one of the most <laughs> romantic stories um, in mathematics, another one, which is Eurozone was a a 22-year-old guy, and he Russian, and he went to um, went to Cambridge to work with uh, uh, mathematicians there. And he went swimming in the lake, and he drowned hmm, at 26. So that was bad. Um, and um, 
Eurozone's work is still alive in mathematics, but this beautiful object doesn't seem to um, doesn't seem to have enough. Uh, um, I try to tell you about R. I hope it's not too weird that you can't become friends with it. Um, if you wanted to learn more, this is just a wonderful article, and uh, please try to take a look at it. You'll you'll say thanks. That's my story. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Quiet surrender. All right. I can. I don't know if that counts as magic tricks, but sort of magical. Uh, Thank you very much. We'll now have, um, I think, about 10 minutes for Q&A. So please type your questions in the chat. I can um, start off with a question. Good. So this is for a random graph with um, probability one half of two edges being connected. How much do things change as you sort of slide the probability between zero and one? And is that an even an interesting question? They, they don't at? change at all. All of those, if you fix, if you fix a probability, say a 10th, they're all isomorphic. So that's, it. It shows, is there really such a thing? I mean, that's a theorem because the way we constructed it, you know, what's the chance that 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 property fails? Well, I said it's, you know, one minus a half to the n plus n. Well, if you have p as your probability of an edge, it's one minus p to the n plus n, but then I get to raise that to the nth power. So it's zero, right? You could even make the probabilities, you know, very, you know, in some reasonable way, as long as that argument doesn't get broken. Um, so it, it's, it's very unsettling, this object. That's, that's what I have. To, at least that's the way I feel about it. You know, and it makes me, makes me wonder, is there really such a thing? Well, we built it though. So, you know, the construction in the primes or the construction in the integers, it's hard to argue with that, uh, but, but. We have um, some other questions. Someone is wondering, uh, what are a couple of areas that this could be applied to? I just asked Peter Cameron that. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think, well, I'll answer it two ways. Um, I'll, I'll answer, I'll tell you how I stumbled into it. And, um, and then I'll tell you what Peter's answer was. But I think this is just some, you know, gem that some artist created and it's a beautiful object. That's a good way of thinking about it. But so I don't, okay, I'll tell you what I'm doing uh, looking at it. So um, with Marianthi Milleris, we were trying to describe how one proves that you can't do something. And there, um, the, I'll, I'll just tell you what the thing was. So we were looking at a family of groups, the group of n by n uni upper triangular matrices with entries mod two, say. So there are ones on the diagonal, there are zeros below the diagonal, and there are stuff above the diagonal. This that's not a weird group, you know, it's the CELO two subgroup of the general linear group. Um, and um, uh, for my own purposes, I needed to know what are the conjugacy classes of that group and what are the characters. So I wouldn't usually say that, uh, but in an undergraduate audience, but anyway, it was the question that I needed to do. And nobody knows. Of course, when n is three, when n is four, when n is five, we know they're finite problems. But when n is 15, nobody can describe the conjugacy classes or the characters, and they, they even with big computers, and they seem to get more and more complicated. Well, how do you prove, and so there's a sense in which you can prove that nobody will ever be able to do that. So that's interesting. And uh, that's the language of tame and wild and quivers. And, um, and I didn't find it satisfying. So I, this problem is intractable. And I, I wanted to show that it was intractable in a way that I found compelling. And um, uh, because for, for close to 100 years, people have been trying to do it and nobody can do it. Um, and what I thought was the following. If I take this group, I could make a graph out of it, which is called the commuting graph. That is, you, the, the vertices are the elements of the group. And you connect to if they if the two elements commute. So you connect, you know, S and T if S T is equal to T S in the group. And um, that's a graph. And I thought if I can find the random graph in that graph, 
that'll show that you can't do it because we know that nobody can describe randomness. Well, that, that's how I got into it. And um, I, I didn't succeed, but we're working on it. And, uh, and there's much more to say. But so I don't know if that counts as an answer. Um, the random walk we were thinking about is a very tractable walk. You start at the identity matrix, you pick a row at random, and you add or subtract it to the row above it. That's all. And uh, you just, and, and I wanted to know how long does that walk take to mix? Um, this is an analog of random transpositions with cards. So I had a fairly concrete problem and I, I stumbled into the random graph. I'm looking for it in this construction. I found lots of them in the commuting graph, um, but I can't, I, I have found lots of random graphs in the commuting graph of this. I have to, sorry, I have to, make an infinite version of the group, but there is a natural infinite version of the group. Um, Peter Cameron had a specific group theory problem uh, in which the existence of the random graph showed that there were no groups of a certain type, certain kinds of Burnside groups. So those are applications, at least in math. And uh, does it have an application in biology? Ah, come on. <laughs> you know. I, I don't want to pretend that it does. And if somebody was pretending uh, that it did, I'd throw a pie at them. That's what I have to say. Uh, we but, have another question. You know, I'm moving on. Uh, from Robin Armstrong. Uh -huh. And he was wondering, you said earlier that you couldn't add just a singleton vertex without breaking the random graph properties. Is there any way to, I mean, if it's like if you add a vertex and randomly link it up, then it will sort of preserve the properties. Sure. Is there any way to sort of get more specific about in what circumstances you can add an extra vertex? I see. I was just saying if you add a vertex and don't connect it to anything, um, uh, but I guess you could, and as, as the question said, if you add a vertex and connect it to a random collection of points, well, that's fine. That's the random graph again. You can do that. And suppose I added the vertex to an arbitrary countable collection of points. I don't know. I never thought about it. What a good question. I, I don't. I don't know the answer. That is, um, when when can you add a add a vertex? I, I was just I was just trying to give an indication that this thing is is you know is not some very refined thing. It's very very you know coarsely robust. But that's a, a, a ask me next time. I don't. I'll think about it. But I don't. I don't know the answer. And happy to hear if somebody else. Answers it. Okay. okay, and uh, one more question. Would it be reasonable to think of L to the N G as N approaches infinity has the rate of graphs as its limit, where L to the N G is starting with a simple graph G that is not a clause cycler path, and L to the N means take the line graph operation L times or N times? Oh, I don't know uh, um, how, how nice. So, so this touches on something that I find disturbing, uh, which is in classical erdos renyi style or Lovas style, you know, random graph theory, um, we, we, we have models of, of finite random graphs. And then we, there's, there are limiting objects and the properties of the limiting object capture, you know, the limiting properties of big graphs. That's that's what limiting objects should do for a living. And um, what the, the way I began was saying, well, you know, take an erdos renyi random graph and pick two of them. You know, the chance that they're isomorphic is essentially zero. But when you pass to the limit, the chance becomes one. So there's some sense in which this thing isn't a limit. And what are the, what's the finite content in the theorems about the random graph? I don't know. And Mary Anthe, who's a wonderful logician, when I press her on that point, um, she lives up there at infinity and or even beyond, well beyond. And, um, and when I say, well, what's the finite content in this? And she says, you're such a finitist. And it's not a nice word. It's not a, you know, being a finitist isn't, isn't good. So I don't know the answer. It would be nice to have a limiting, a, a limiting sequence of objects, we'd have to say what it means for the graph 
you know, it wouldn't be in the usual notion of graph limit theory, I don't think. Um, uh, uh, but it would be nice to, this thing is this Fresse limit though, but maybe that explains why Fresse, it's the Fresse limit of all finite graphs. So, but Fresse limit is different than other limits. And um, I, I, if there's a way of somebody sending me the question because it was, had a little too many ideas in it for me to parse it. So if you can just send it, or if it's on the chat, I'll be able to look at it probably. Uh, then I'll try to think about it and answer it. So. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, I think we'll have to cut you off now and move on for next speaker. Sure. But uh, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It was really nice to hear, hear about all lots of random graph. Great, thank you.